Uh, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And uh, this is some night. Uh, this is going to be some night. <laughs> In fact, tonight was the night that I thought we would drift entirely, <laughs> like we would forget. We would completely forget about the sutra that we were doing, <laughs> and we would just talk about pranya tonight. Uh, transcendent wisdom. That's that's the idea for tonight. Um, again, welcome back, everybody. Um, this is our deep dive into the uh, ten paramitas, in particular, the sutra of Bodhisattva Akshayamati, Bodhisattva Inexhaustible Wisdom. You know this Bodhisattva. You know, thank good, thank goodness for this Bodhisattva, right? Because he asked this great question about how do you attain enlightenment? How? What is the enlightened mind or bodhicitta? What is it all about? And the Buddha told us, oh, it's all about these 10 practices, qualities, excellences, otherwise known as paramitas. It's all about these 10 paramitas generosity, moral discipline, patience, determination or drive, meditation or dhyana. And tonight the the sixth the the like the this major paramita, the Buddha said, oh yeah, the mind of enlightenment is definitely about pranya. Uh, so we have, you know, a few more to go, but we're going to sink in tonight into a nice, deep conversation about prajna, transcendent wisdom. If, if you're a regular Dharma Doors uh, participant, of course, you know right away, prajna, oh, that's, that's our wheelhouse. That's where we hang out in the Dharma Doors is in prajna, right? You know, it's like, you know, generosity, dana. Yeah, yeah, practice generosity, right? Sure, donate, donate to the San Francisco Dharma Collective and support the Dharma doors. Yeah, great. But we don't do a lot of talking about that. We don't do a lot of talking about generosity because you kind of you do it, right? Moral discipline. I, I personally, right, we don't spend a lot of time talking about shila, moral discipline. I'm, I'm not the person to tell you how to live your life. I'm trying to keep my own life together, right? So about what you, ha you know, should do or shouldn't do and how you should speak, you know, moral discipline, good luck. You know, we're all, we're all doing the best we can with that. And again, you you know, I don't tend to step up and try to talk about moral discipline that much, right? Patience, of course, patience is a virtue. That's what they say. Patience is a virtue, right? And so we love, we love talking about, we love thinking about patience, being patient, right? Virya, determination or drive, it's another one where you, you got to get out and do, you got to be driven. I don't know how to, I don't know, I don't know, but you, did you know, Virya, right? We talked about it all night, one night. And then Dhyana, right? The fifth paramita, Dhyana, meditation. That's always a tricky one. I managed to talk for an hour and a half about meditation without ever actually doing meditation. But the idea is, is that, you know, dhyana, mindfulness, right? The, 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 the practice of, you know, I don't know how to, we don't, you do, you do that. But pranya, yeah, we can, we can talk about pranya. So that's the topic tonight. Again, I'm not going to introduce the whole sutra and all of that. We're just doing a deep dive into this idea of the sixth paramita, the sixth practice or quality that the bodhisattva is cultivating. Uh, I'm going to do it again. Yes, the, the bodhisattva cultivates generosity. Yeah, 
Yes, the Bodhisattva cultivates moral discipline. The Bodhisattva cultivates patience. The Bodhisattva cultivates drive or determination, stick, stick to itness. The Bodhisattva cultivates meditation, peaceful mind states, dhyana. And tonight we're going to talk about the Bodhisattva's practice of wisdom. And in keeping with the sutra, we're going to talk about 10 dharmas, 10 things, 10 qualities, practices, or 10, 10 things. Let's just go with things tonight, right? 10 things the Bodhisattva considers foremost. Let's stick to the language of the sutra. The Bodhisattva considers foremost in the cultivation of this pranya, these 10 things. I think, I think, <laughs> before we even get started in this dive into pranya and these 10 qualities, I think we should have a conversation about pranya. I think that we should establish what it is we're talking about exactly so that these 10 things are a little bit more exciting. So this particular idea of wisdom, transcendent wisdom, pranya, pranya, right? It's a very special idea in Buddhism. Yes, it gets translated as wisdom as if it's about being really smart or having a lot of knowledge or I don't know what I, you know, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of wisdom. Um, obviously with this white beard, I'm, I'm pretty close, right? So, you know, this idea that like white beards and wisdom, it's, it's absurd. It's totally absurd. But so I, I want to establish what exactly this, it's a special kind of wisdom. And at the, at, the risk, at the risk of derailing this entire Dharma talk from the beginning, I'm gonna actually attempt a little, uh, you know, one of those, uh, those like little shots to get us started. Just a little something to get our brains working in the right way. Um, and it's sort of about this like, Pranya, wisdom, like what, what, what is that? If it's not a gray white beard and knowledge and book smarts and all of that, like what exactly is Pranya? Well, you should know of course that in the earliest, earliest Buddhist traditions, we're talking Pali canon type of stuff. There is this idea in Pali, it's called Panna. In Sanskrit, they call it pranya. It's the same idea. But in the earliest schools of Buddhism or the earliest thinking of Buddhism, pranya was a particular type of knowledge or wisdom that concerned emptiness, shunyata. So it's not you know, about particle physics, molecular biology, it's not about that. It's not a knowledge or a wisdom concerning molecules and all of that. It's a wisdom or a knowledge that understands, maybe, but understands or you know comprehends emptiness. That's pranya. But what does it mean to comprehend or understand pranya. The, the simple way, the simplest way that I have figured out thus far to, to even, you know, in, you know, I'm trying to do this in a couple minutes. <laughs> so the, the easiest way that I've figured out how to try to do this in a couple minutes is to talk about an object and, you know, there's a million, zillion, bajillion objects you could choose, but I'm gonna choose 
like I often do, the phenomena of an apple. And apples, of course, tend to come in varieties of colors, but they tend to come in multiple uh, varieties of red and green. And the idea of this analogy or this example of having an apple, like let's say I had an apple and I were to ask you, what color is the apple? And if you were to say red, the, the apple is red. The idea from a Buddhist point of view is recognizing, realizing and understanding that the color that is experienced as red, the red apple, is actually a particular phenomena, the redness, is a particular phenomena that is arising when your eyeball, this your particular kind of eyeball, encounters the world of form of, say, this apple and there arises this color of red and you see the apple is red but of course what i'm getting at is that there might be somebody else who has a different set of eyes with a different configuration of rods and cones as they're called meaning that they process phenomena differently and so somebody else might see that same apple and see it as green. So this person's eyes are creating a, the phenomena of a green apple because of the way that they are wired, hardwired or whatever. And somebody else's eyes, hardwired a different way, produce the a phenomena of a, of a red apple. And the question becomes, who's who's right like like let's stop with the semantics right what color is the apple really like in reality and the idea of course is that the apple is no color in reality what reality is, is that for this person, based on their eyes, it appears red, and this person, it appears green. And that's what's real, is the phenomenal appearance for each individual. But, but the, the, the apple, that, that, like the one, that, that, the one in my hand or whatever, right? The idea of like, what color is that apple? Well, if, if you're following my example, which is a you know, carefully constructed example concerning dependent origination where the redness or the greenness is a dependently originated phenomena, dependent upon your particular eyes and that particular apple. But the redness or the greenness is not, and this is the most important part of what I'm about to say, that redness or the greenness is not held, owned, or possessed by the apple. It's not a quality, a lakshana, it's not a quality of the apple. It's a quality of the arising experience between your eyes and that phenomena. And so it is neither red nor green. Again, it is a dependently originated phenomena for each individual in that way. If you understand that, the most, again, the most important part about everything I just said is that the redness or the greenness is actually not in, on, or owned or possessed by the object outside you. You think that. And, and of course, if I gave you the choice of apples and I was like, you want the red one or the green one, you would think like the redness or the greenness is out in the world, out in the world. 
And what we miss, this is what the, the Buddha is trying to tell us. This is the wisdom the Buddha is trying to tell us about. You, it's actually the redness is a dependently originated phenomena that's not over there. It's not over on or in the apple, but it's also not in or on my eye, right? It's a dependently originated phenomena. It takes these two to, to tango, right? It takes the apple in my eye to create this kind of redness or greenness or whatever it is. You might have crazy eyes that see purple apples. And the idea is, is that for you, they're purple. And for me, they're red. And for this person, they're green. And the reality is that it isn't actually any particular color because the quality of that is not owned. It's not in. It's not in the apple. So if you just understood, if you understood that, how the quality or the of color is not in the object, but it is arising in the in-between, dependently at pratitya samutpata, pratitya, right? Codependently arising. That phenomena where it's it's tricky and you think the color's actually like on the object, you think it's in it, on it, but it's actually in the in-between. Without going too far along on this, the idea is, is that step one is recognizing that color is dependently originated. But then I would tell you that actually from a Buddhist point of view, all qualities and characteristics, meaning all lakshana are dependently originated. So even the roundness, or that if you were to take a bite, the sweetness, the crunchy texture, all of these things are actually arising in an in-between space, but we deludedly think they are, it's a round, red, crunchy, sweet apple. Michael, I've oh got yeah. So it's so interesting. You one can talk about this topic over and over, and you feel like I get it, and then I lost it again. I get it, and lost it. <laughs> but um, just as a side note, um, but you know, I'm still thinking. Um, I mean, I understand what you're saying and what you're sharing, but I'm still thinking there's this sense of what comes to mind. There is the sense of a shared reality that is experienced. You know, so um, so. How does this come into play in, in Buddha Dharma? Um, through language. In, now, in a sense, for example, now what I mean is, um, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is if we take the example of the, the, the apple, right? And we say, yeah. okay, you are a healthy person and I'm healthy and like everything is function, you know, functioning as it should be, you know, and, um, we take all these 17 people and they all have like, you know, their eyes are correct and blah, 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 right? So even though we all have, a, you know, individual perception on, yep. on, you know, different levels, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I never know, but out of the 17 people, probably most of us would, rec when you would a, like a, a draw an apple on the whiteboard a red like a red one you know and you would then we all we all would say okay that's that's red so yep yeah and I, I hear you Connie and it, it it's so funny it's so funny because so the all 17 all 17 of you I assume right when I said, I have an apple in my hand, nobody was confused, even though I was just doing this. But what I mean to say is, is that I said the word apple and everybody knew what I was talking about. And so that's why Connie, when I just bluntly said language, that's, that's the conventional connection there's nothing actually more to say than that. Of mm. course, there's much more to say in language, 
But what I, what I mean to say, ah, it's getting crazy. But what I mean to say is, is that when I introduced the idea of an apple, all of you, every, even though it wasn't even here, I didn't even have to show you. I just could say the word apple and everybody would know, oh, Michael's talking about a... So the, 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 the consensus reality, the shared reality is based on um, language and based on, not in a negative sense, based on conditioning. The apple is not red, but there's a quality we agree on that it is red or, you know, okay. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, Connie. Now, if everybody's comfortable with that idea, now there's, I'm leaving out so many steps between here and Pranya. I'm leaving out so many steps that I'm going to need you because I, I wanna to get to the list, I wanna to get to the whiteboard. So there's like step A for Apple, step A is the, the color. And, and there's a way in which I love to begin with color because I think that we can all grok that. We can all get how, oh yeah, if, if even if you went in and got a, a surgery on your eyeball, they could go in and tweak your rods and cones and you would start seeing green apples as red or red apples as green. Like we all kind of understand that type of phenomenal um, arising of color the steps that I'm leaving out are B, C, D, E, F, which are about shape, taste, all of these other qualities that are actually have the same dependently originated nature as the color. It's trickier than that because I know that as we go deeper with these, it's like, no, 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 no. Around, something round is round. Cause you know what I mean, right? Cause round. So I know that it gets harder and harder and harder to understand how all qualities are arising in the in-between. So without going into all of those, because again, I want to get to the board and this was just supposed to be a quick intro to Pranya. If you understand how it is that it appears that there is a color to the object, right? So I have my red object. If it appears that this is red, but if you understand, oh, no, 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 no. I get how my mind is sort of thrusting that onto the object, but it's actually arising in the in-between. If you understand that the color is not there, but in an in-between state, what pranya is, it's not only under, like it's not only thinking in terms of dependent origination. It's not only thinking about how the, the color isn't there, but it, it's not only that. If I were to go fast forward all the way to, to step Z of pranya, the last step, it's realizing that the conscious experience that's, that you're having right now, although you might think it's possessed, owned, and held in some brain space inside you, it too is a dependently originated phenomena that exists or abides nowhere. But it's a convenient aspect of the delusion to think that it's happening over here and in here just like it's a convenient aspect to think that the color is on the object. So pranya, the, the joke is of course, is that you never, you never have such wisdom as pranya because if you're attached to a self, you, you are immediately <laughs> disqualified from the pranya program. The idea is, is that it's pranya is what, when you were like, whoa, con my con consciousness is not happening like I thought it was happening. That's sort of like in a beginning of pranya understanding. And that's where it's very different than just a, a white beard or book smarts in that way. It's actually about a 
a whole different ontology, a whole different understanding of being that includes the subjective self as a dependently originated phenomena in all of this. Questions or comments about Pranya before we actually get in to the sutra? Yeah, Tanya. Um, so, and if this is too much of a, if this will derail things, just we can cut it off. But, um, you know, when I was thinking about dependent origination, that's sort of a little bit, in some ways, dualistic, right? Because you've got things interacting. However, but you need, but they're dependent on each other to exist. So, and it's, it's not like I'm only interacting with one thing at a time, like, you know, her or the wall, it's all happening all at once. But anyway, yep. so it's still sort of, yeah. Do you get where I'm going? And, and, I and again, do. Go ahead. I get, I exactly get where you're going with. And it's this idea of like, okay, so if it's, if it's, if it's this and this that kind of get together to make this, then, then what about these? Well, the idea is, is that, well, let's just take this one. Let's forget about this one for a minute. Let's just take this one. The idea is that this also has a dependently originated nature based on say this and this. And then you're like, okay, well then what about those? And it's like, okay, well, and it's uh, ad infinitum as they would say, where there's, a nev there's a never an end to this dependent origination thing. And if you, not an end, it's not an end, but it might be a beginning. And the idea is, is that a kind of an initial, the initial construction of A and B, can we call them A and B? The initial construction of A and B is the ignorant dualistic conception of self and other. And as soon as you have the, even the concept of self and other, it's like the reality starts to fracture into all of these variety of things. And at that point, you're in an infinite world of dependent origination based on any given, any given perception. That as soon as it's a nose, oh, eyeballs, ears, forehead, because it's a nose. But you think it's a nose because you think it's, you know, it's like this kind of constant duality game in a way. Does that make sense, Tanya? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, to really, it was an awesome question and to really answer it, yeah, it probably would derail this, so. But I hope that suffices for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So that's cool. Little intro to, intro to Pranya, if you didn't know. I think it's helpful so that we know like, oh, we're talking about like something kind of special then. This isn't just like, you know, like wisdom. It's actually a very different way of relating with reality in that sense. And so the Buddha says, yeah, and here are the 10 foremost ways. Again, I don't know exactly how to translate this idea, but these dharmas, these practices or ways or things to consider when developing pranya. Number one <clears throat> is uh, this idea of directly perceiving the skandhas. Of course, I hope you, I, I, I assume you know about the skandhas, but if you don't, you know, the idea of course is that in Buddhism, the Buddha came along and sort of introduced this very, interesting idea that while there appears to be a, a self, like a, a you that has existed for your whole life, that idea of a single self, what, what, I, what I like to call the perceiver or experiencer of one's life, 
what we have this notion that there has been, well, uh, frankly, that I, that I have been my whole life. I, it even starts to sound absurd, but the idea that I have been my whole life, meaning when I was a baby and I was like in the crib and there was the mobile, I, I was the experiencer of the mobile. When I went to elementary school, I was the experiencer of the elementary school. When I went to high school, college, I was the experience. And now I'm the experiencer of this. Well, the idea of a consistent experiencer of one's life, what we, what we would call ourselves, right? Well, that idea of a self, a consistent, always there, although changing, although changing radically and growing and morphing, the idea that there was a self there the whole time is basically what the Buddha sort of, or Buddhism denies or suggests is not the case. And rather than a consistent experiencer of one's life, there is actually this almost essentially moment by moment experience of a coagulation, if I might, you know, they're called the skandhas, which means like aggregation, but you can also think of it as like coagulating, binding together. And so there are these five skandhas that the Buddha introduced, the idea of the, um, the molecular biological formation of the body, right? So form, the molecular biological coagulation of sensory organs, so sensations, the coagulation into perceptual, perceptual ideas, basically, perception, so form or material matter, sensations, perception, the repetitive perception of something and therefore the conditioning of it as that. And then a kind of phenomenal emergent conscious experience that is actually kind of a dependently originated phenomena of our conditioning based on our perception, based on our sensory organs, based on this coagulation of form. <laughs> That's what the Buddha said regarding these five skandhas. If, if, if that's like still, if you're like, wait, what? Then you got to see some other Dharma talks or something because I can't do the whole skandha talk tonight. But the idea is, is that the Buddha replaced the idea of an essential self or a consistent experiencer of one's life with the idea of an emergent phenomenal experiencer that is the result of essentially these five coagulations of material matter, sensory organs, perceptive choices, conditioning and consciousness. And the first step on prana here is to, the verb here is actually very important. It is to perceive the skandhas. And Without, because I have a lot of things I want to share tonight, I want to just tell you that if you are familiar with a little sutra known as the Heart Sutra <laughs> that begins the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, while practicing this Pranyaparamita, clearly saw or clearly perceived the five skandhas as being empty and thus overcome and thus overcomes or thus overcame all suffering that's the first line of the heart sutra and that's the first of these practices to directly perceive the five skandhas as being empty and of course what we mean by empty is like that apple concerning its color. 
that it has no it has no color because the color is emerging in the in between therefore the the color over here and shunyata empty no there's no there's no color over here it's dependently originated well avi lokateshvara bodhisattva realized that even the skandhas are actually not here like the color of the apple they too are empty that is, that by the way that, that that is like you you don't even really need to read the whole heart sutra you can really just read avilokiteshvara bodhisattva practicing pranayama to realize the five skandhas are empty and then you could close the sutra and that's it and that again is this first idea the the bodhisattva practice of pranya is and it's why i did the introduction that I wanted to do, which was about trying to, you know, separate out these qualities from the things that we think own them. So separating out the redness, because again, where we're going with this is like, wow, even the consciousness, vinyana, even the perception and the conditioning, all of that actually are emergent phenomena that are not they're not housed anywhere. They, they, they appear to be housed somewhere. They appear not to be over here, but to be here. But that's like the color of the apple. No. So I feel like it's a whole nother evening, but the, to you, you kind of uh, glossed over that directly perceiving all skandhas is perceiving them as empty. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's not so obvious, like how <laughs> perceiving something is perceiving it as empty. Or is it? I mean, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where, you know, it's, it's your question, you know, it's, it's where this idea of emptiness is, it's very tricky because of course it doesn't mean not real. It doesn't mean uh, it, that it's not like happening. So is it, is it sort of, is one way of looking at it tantamount, is it tantamount to perceiving it as the each, the, each of the skandhas as ever changing? Like, is that, a way of thinking of them as being, if you're directly perceiving them, you're not, they're not, you're not, it's not, it's not like, oh yes, con there's conditioned mind. Like as soon as you say it, you're not really directly perceiving it anymore. So it's, there's something about it's kind of ever changing quality. I don't know. Um, I think what's really, um, you know, I keep using this word phenomena, that there can be phenomenal existence, like which is the experience of something without it being as tangibly real as we might think in that way. And what this particular shift, and, and, and of course, you know, I'm kind of, I guess I'm actually assuming a lot, which is that you know, I do so much talking and Dharma talking about old school Buddhism, new school Buddhism. And indeed, old school Buddhism, kind of the original program, was about essentially the liber the the, the liberation, but the 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 liberation that comes from not clinging to that sense of the experiencer of one's life. Letting go of that idea of like, that that was you in the crib looking at the mobile and that was you in elementary school and even that was you in high school. Letting, letting that person be that person and in a way letting go of that is from a buddhist point of view liberating <laughs> it liberates us from our past in a, a bunch of different ways that are very 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 healthy but the idea and it's also just sort of true that that wasn't you in the crib 
this is you now. So the original program of Buddhism was sort of about getting over that idea of the, that consistent perceiver or experiencer of one's life, in particular as being housed between the ears and behind the eyes in some way. And the, what the Buddha, so the Buddha took away the Atman, took away the self and, and not because it existed, but revealed to us that, oh yeah, that actually is not really what's going on. These five skandhas are kind of what's going on. You're a biological organism with sensory organs. Don't know what happened there. Biological <laughs> organism with sensory organs that get uh, that have perception choices, that get conditioned, and that's what you are. And like the sooner you kind of get in groove with that, the less suffering will happen. And there's a way in which that is not denied by this. But the deeper teaching of dependent origination is this radical new ontology, a radical new science of being where being is not molecular objects in space and time, but actually phenomenal perceptions based on ignorance and delusion. And so that is, is, again, it's like radically different to say, oh, wow, the skandhas too are these like colors, like dependently originated phenomena that aren't actually abiding or aren't actually locatable anywhere. Whoa. <laughs> and again, emptiness is this tricky thing where it, it denies the substantial existence of external objects, but does not deny phenomenal experience. It explains phenomenal experience. <laughs> I don't know if that helps, but. It did help. Even okay. though, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Cool. All right. Any other questions about number one? Okay. Um, by the way, uh, um, directly perceiving, I mean, I could be here all night talking about this particular idea, but it, it is a, um, it, you know, it's not with the eyes. It is not this guan, the, the, the guan, in Chinese it's guan. I'm not sure what it is in Sanskrit but it is not done with the eyes or the ears or the nose or the tongue or the body or even the brain. This type of perceiving is a, is a more in the realm of pranya. It's more of a wisdom type of a thing in that way. So I want you to kind of know that, that it's like, if it's, a, if it's an existence that's being perceived through eyes that could be like put under a microscope, yeah, that's not what we're talking about. But if it's kind of about dependently originated phenomena and understanding that, that's to directly perceive or understand in that way. And so number two is to, to guan, to directly perceive and understand all realms. All realms uh technically it kind of says like all realms and locations the the sanskrit of course would be to directly perceive all dattus a dattu is a realm or a dimension and while while traditionally in buddhism there are only three dattus there are only three realms there are three dimensions to reality, traditionally. The realm of desire, the kama datu, sensual desire, the realm of sensual desire, the rupa datu, the realm of form, and the formless realm, the arupa datu. And there's a way, of course, to read number two as the bodhisattva directly perceives the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm and directly perceives them vis-a-vis -vis in accordance with pranya. 
And, and what I mean by that, of course, is that the original Buddhist program of which I spoke earlier, they had this idea that like our eyes and our ears and our nose and our tongue and our body and our brain are clouded with desire, kama. Kama, K-A-M-M-A, very related to karma. Karma is the action to satisfy kama. So there's a, etymologically and all kinds of ways, they're very related. But kama, K-A-M-M-A, is like sensual desire. And so there's the idea from a Buddhist, old school Buddhist point of view, that we view reality through these like lenses of our desire. <laughs> and of course, what you desire is totally different than what I desire, totally different than what your neighbor desires. And so the idea is, is that we each have our lenses of desire that are unique to us, that we see the world through. Now, we don't actually often know and recognize that we have these goggles of desire on, we just think it's the world. We, th we just assume everybody wants what we want and everybody just, it's just what it is. Now, the idea uh, traditionally in Buddhism is to, through meditation, to recognize the goggles of desire. And if you sort of take off the goggles of desire, you can see just the realm of pure form, as it's called. So not seeing things, an, a, a classic example I often give is something like this. Good old, good old fashioned greenback, right? And the idea of course, is that if you're seeing this as, as money, that's the realm of desire. And I don't just mean because you want it. It's actually not what I mean at all. What the realm of desire is, is that in order for this to be money, you, you need to know about banks, credit, debt, all kinds. Of, you need to know about Thomas Jefferson, and you got to know about the Ro Roman number system to evaluate this. There's all kinds of stuff that your conditioned mind brings to the viewing of this. But now imagine you know, the proverbial, the proverbial noble savage, right, that we find in the Amazon. And they're so, you know, removed from society. And you show them something like this, they don't know about banks. They don't know about Roman numbers and value. They don't know about Thomas Jefferson. So you would, you could wave this in front of them and they would see a rectangular, flat, maybe piece of paper. Maybe they would be so clued in to know that it's cotton. I don't know. But the idea is, is that they wouldn't be seeing what you're seeing. So the idea is, is that to see this as the root of all evil or um, uh, you know, a cup of coffee, to see it in its relational aspect, that's all realm of desire stuff. To see it just for its form, meaning it's kind of its shape, its basic general, just what it is in that way. That would be the realm of form. The formless realm is, of course, very, very, very tricky. It's like so tricky, right? Um, everybody, I can't really leave you hanging on the realm of the formless realm. My, the, here's the, this is, by the way, what's wonderful about Buddhism is that you may have already recognized that the, the realm of desire and the realm of form, they're, they're both right here, but it's sort of a matter of your mind, right? And if your mind is thinking in terms of value or what have you, then now you're in the realm of desire. But if you can kind of just sort of like let go of all of that and like, I don't know, maybe in some sort of trance state, just sort of see the shape, differentiation of light and dark. 
So the idea is, again, the realm of form, the realm of desire, they're both right here. But depending on where your mind's at, right? Well, the formless realm is really tricky, right? So here's, here's my example of the formless realm. What is this? What is it? Now, if, if you set a $2 bill, you're probably still back in the realm of desire. If you set a rectangular flat sheet of paper, yeah, maybe you're in the realm of form. Maybe, maybe. But the idea is, is that it, it, may, it may not have occurred to you to say a guy with a $2 bill. <laughs> Meaning that when I ask you, what is this? You, you make the decision to delineate out what it is I'm talking about. And that's actually your mind dipping into the realm of the formlessness and creating form. When I said, what is this? Your mind may have wondered, I don't know. I don't know what he means. I must know, I must know what he means. And so the, the coagulation of this, oh, he must have been talking about that or that. What is he? So the idea is, is that the formless realm is everywhere in that way. And it is the mind that separates and delineates out and says, this is what I'm talking about. Similarly, this could be one object. Sorry, this could be one object. But then if I asked you about the portrait, you would have to separate the portrait from the bill, right? And now all of a sudden the portrait is different and you out of space, out of formlessness have made form. So the bodhisattva is interested in directly perceiving all realms, not just the realm of desire, not just the realm of form, and not just the formless realm, but actually in a way, I would suggest that to directly perceive all forms is to actually see how all forms are equally the same in the sense that even the realm of form is a type of desire. And then even the formless realm, as it is juxtaposed to the realm of form, is a form of desire. It is, there's a way in which the bodhisattva is interested in the, the formation of realms, whether they be of desire, of just form, or even the formless realm. In earlier Buddhism, they made a clear distinction between desire being kind of very bad, realm of form being like, it's pretty sweet. The formless realm is exalt, exalted. The formless realm in old school Buddhism is like, it's basically nirvana. It's basically heaven. The Bodhisattva though is curious about this heaven versus hell or this sort of like mundane versus transmundane distinction. And so the Bodhisattva views all three realms as dependently originated. This is the Pranya game. This is, again, I don't want to stray too far from our point. This is about the development of Pranya and applying this type of wisdom regarding dependent origination, not just to the five skandhas in step one, but even applying it to all phenomenal realms. Everybody good with that? There's a lot more I could say about that, but I'm gonna keep moving on. Number three. So this is again where this sutra, even though it's a Mahayana sutra, Bodhisattva path sutra, Number three, right view. This is the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path. This is classic. 
and I like I the reason why I chose this sutra is because it is it's you know it's deep in the cut of bodhisattva practice, but it shows you that it never strays too far from the original practice. And in, and maybe more importantly, it includes the original practice. So I don't ever, you know, really want to pivot old school against new school, like it's like a new thing. It's just that the new school includes the old school. And that includes this idea of samyak drishti, having the right view. And if, and if you don't know about drishtis, this idea of having a view, you should think, you sh should think about this idea of a view. What the Buddhists are talking about with this idea of, of right view, samyak drishti, a drishti is, yes, it's, a, it's a, a, a gaze, a view, but in English, we talk about having like a political view or having a world view. That's the view that we're talking about. It's something like, well, it's much stronger than an opinion. Much, 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 much stronger than an opinion. Because an opinion, if you have an opinion, you recognize that your opinion is yours and somebody else might have a different opinion. But a worldview, views, drishtis, these are like, these are fundamental to the way you see the world, right? So when, when Buddhists talk about a drishti, talk about these idea of views, we're talking about like religious views, deep views about, well, you know, about what's important, what's not important, what's value, what's not valuable, like, you know, really consider worldviews or religious views and the way in which in particular, I want you to think about the way that a worldview or even a political view actually, but a religious view, I want you to think about how they, how they come first. It's like that, that view is the, my fundamental way of seeing the world through which all other things will be evaluated in that way. So these, the view is, is, is really, really, really interesting and very important. And in Buddhism, the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path is establishing the right view. And there's a lot of different ways that this is taught. There's a lot of different ways that it's interpreted, even within Buddhism, even within the long history of Buddhism what constitutes right or correct view is tricky, but there's a few like, there's a few like major guidelines. <laughs> what like one of the primary guidelines is say something like impermanence. It is the right view in Buddhism to view all things as impermanent, as not, lasting as in a process of kind of decay. And even though this is totally in line with modern day physics and the laws of thermodynamics and everything else, even though there's a way in which we all know this to be dharma, we all know this to be true, we can have a way in which we forget or we fight against it where we basically try to hold on to something as it is, not remembering that all things are impermanent. And the basic idea is, is that the right view is if you view all things as decaying, you will have the right disposition towards them. Now, I'm a big fan of this, this really, really heavy Buddhist idea. And this is a heavy idea. And the idea is, is that the real right view is to not have a fixed view. And the tricky, the really, 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 really tricky part about that 
is that the moment you go like, yeah, that's a great, that's a great view to not have a view. No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. We were not talking about a fixed view, even if it's the fixed view that to not have a fixed view is the right. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. We're actually talking about a mind that is more malleable and comfortable in that space and doesn't need or want even to settle on a view. That, well, you know, if, if, if you look ahead at, at number six, by the way, and I just want you to know that number six is the Bodhisattva then when they get to step six, they're into abandoning all views. <laughs> So that should give you a little insight into where this is going. So even if right view is viewing all things as impermanent or even as all things as empty, we're eventually gonna have to even let, let go of that view. So I just that was just a sneak peek. <laughs> Questions, answers, comments about right view? Right view is, yeah, is pretty straightforward. Number four, right mindfulness. This is sati. This is that idea of focus, awareness. A few steps ago in right drive, when we discussed the 10 steps of the 10 steps of right drive or right virya, we cultivated our mindfulness. But this is the actual eightfold step of right or correct mindfulness. Traditionally in Buddhism, this is the sati patana the four foundations of mindfulness are usually what constitute right mindfulness, being aware of the body, sensations of the body, the mind states that those sensations of the body produce, and then ultimately being mindful of Dharma, like we're doing tonight. But that's sort of the idea of right mindfulness. And because the end the end goal, or I don't want to put it up as a goal, but the end result of right mindfulness is the contemplation of dharma or dharmas. That should fit right in with the conversation of prajna. Right? Everybody good? It's just gotten a little late, so I'm, I moved through these. These are all pretty straightforward too. Like take the next one, for example, number five, fully understanding the Four Noble Truths. So the Bodhisattva in the cultivation of prajna, step five is fully trying to understand the Four Noble Truths. This noble truth of suffering or dukkha, this noble truth of the cause of suffering, this noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and this noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Four Noble Truths. Again, I like this sutra because it shows you the Mahayana never strays from the original teaching in that way. It just includes it. I already mentioned number six. The Bodhisattva then abandons all views. So even if the right view was not defined as not having a view, Step six is definitely, so the bodhisattva is definitely about practicing not clinging to a view. And, you know, frankly, you know, now that, the, now that the, the political season is behind us, I feel a little safer to venture into those waters to even mention it. But, you know, the practice of a view is like a political view. And here we live in this, or if, if you're tuning in from America, we live in this uh, two-party system that's very polarized in that way. And you kind of, even just by living here, you find yourself being forced to sort of take up a view in that way. And then even if you don't want to, even if you don't want to take up a view, you still sort of find yourself falling into, clinging to of uh, this view or that view, right? And it's sort of like, well, I don't know where I stand on that issue. I better cling to a view. And 
in myself personally, as a practitioner, this last uh, electoral season was catching myself, like how it was that I would kind of start to cling to a view and then through a kind of Vipassana practice, kind of look at that and be like, oh, how interesting that I was sort of starting to cling to a view. By the way, as I, I say this often, but I, I always like for this to not go unsaid, abandoning a view <laughs> does not mean abandoning practice or values or anything like that. And, and I, often, I often bring up like the idea of like being a vegan. And so being a vegan is having a view. Eating, like not eating animals is an act. And so you can identify as part of a group and have an identity and all that. Sure, go ahead, you know, go crazy. But that's the view of being a vegan. Then there is the act of sitting down at every time you're gonna eat and asking yourself, is this in line with a vow that I've made to not eat animals? And I hope you can see that actually abandoning a view, abandoning an identity, abandoning all of that actually forces you to be present with each of your acts. You don't get to rely on your view. You actually have to be present each time. And that's in a way actually more challenging than adopting a view and then just being like, oh yeah, I'm a vegan, I eat vegan. Like, so it's, it's real, I just wanna be clear that abandoning a view does not mean abandoning your practice or a vow or anything like that. It just means abandoning a view. <laughs> like that is, that is the only thing that's abandoned. <laughs> so I hope that that's clear. Everybody doing okay? Cool. All right. Oh, we're, we're past halfway point. We're on, we're easy street now. So. Uh, so number seven is going to be familiar to anybody that's been coming to all the classes. And that is that at step seven here, the Bodhisattva cultivates the root of Pranya. And if you were here, any of the last sessions, you will know that there are these five roots, the, these kind of, um, these particular qualities that are developed by the bodhisattva. And so here, it is the development of the root of pranya. And so even though the word is wisdom in Chinese, what the word is referring to is pranya. It is this special type of understanding that we've been talking about all night. And if you were here in the previous classes, you know that these roots, the root of virtue, the root of patience, these roots. The idea is, is that up until this point, up until stage seven, we were kind of like working on our pranya. Like it was sort of like one of those things where it's like, uh, everything's dependently originated, but it sure still seems pretty real. Everything, you know, everything's empty, but it sure just seems not empty. So that up until this point, there's like a back and forth and a back and forth. But the idea of establishing the root of pranya is that this view where all phenomena is dependently originated and therefore not locatable anywhere, anytime, all that, to be fully locked into that view, that's to establish the root of pranya. The idea being that up until this point, you've just been sort of dancing around the idea, but now it's become a deep part of the way you see the world. And if you establish that root of wisdom, step eight, the bodhisattva practicing pranya considers as foremost the patient tolerance for the non-origination of all phenomena. Otherwise known as the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas or the birthlessness of all phenomena. 
This is an idea that gets bandied about a lot in Pranayaparamita Sutras. It is a, you know, a very, very, very important um, step in the Bodhisattva path. So let's break this down. It is the a Kshanti. Kshanti, of course, was our third in the list. This is this patience, contentment, super chill kind of attitude. That's kind of Kshanti. And so this is a particular Kshanti. It's a particular aspect of patient tolerance. And it is the Kshanti, the patient tolerance for the fact or whatever, the Dharma, the truth, that all phenomena are not birthed, not originated. This is a, it's a very, very tricky idea. And I'm, I, of course, I'm, I'm very glad that I spent all the preliminary time talking about prana in general, in particular about how the color of the apple is not located in the apple. It's a dependently originated phenomena that happens in the in-between space and therefore is not located in the apple, right? So if you were with me on that, if you, or if you're, you're really kind of getting that idea that the quality or the characteristic of the color is not owned by it. It just appears that way. This is what we mean by phenomenal existence. It's a, it appears that way. And if you were with me on all of those steps I left out, which were about the shape and how that's dependently originated and the flavor and how that was dependently originated and how actually all of these phenomena are dependently originated. And then refer to Tanya's great question about, well, but what about these two originals and how it keeps digressing and everything ultimately including yourself is a dependently originated phenomena. So if you're with me on that, Let's take a couple steps back to the color. Color is a quality or a characteristic to something. And I just walked you through the pranya steps of how it might appear to be owned by that, but is actually in the in-between. Well, you know, if, if I have something, you know, like what, I have my clock. So I got my clock and I've got uh, Michael. So I got a, a mammal, a mammalian human person and I have a clock. And there's a lot of characteristics and qualities including color and all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of characteristics and qualities that you that go into you differentiating Michael from the clock and that go into you even even knowing that this is a clock, right? It, it has the appearance of a clock, right? The appearance of a human. If you've been, you know, playing along all night, you now are really, really tuned into how all of these char characteristics and qualities, right? are really, you know, not here. Really, really not here in a lot of different ways, right? They're happening in an in-between space. One of the craziest, craziest qualities that things have <laughs> is the appearance of having been made or having been born. What gives you the idea that I was born. So what gives me the what gives me the idea that I was born somewhere? That's the real question. So there's this idea that I was born. And then was it remember when I was in my crib looking at the mobile? Remember that? Remember when I was in elementary school and high school? Remember that? But also remember when I told you how the doctrine of no self in Buddhism would then somehow separate out 
saying, that wasn't me that was in the crib. This is me now having this experience because that's what Michael means right now, having this experience. That is what Michael is right now, having this experience. And if there's an understanding that this is not that and that is not this, then this is also not the thing that came busting out of the womb. This is not the birth thing. This is actually this. And this was not manufactured anywhere. So if you're thinking about a, a being or a creature, this is about the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all creatures. Or at the same time, if we're thinking about inanimate objects, this is the patient tolerance for the non-origination or non-production of all phenomena. It's a very, 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 very subtle idea, but it's about recognizing the kind of um, timeless nature of dependent origination. And, it's, and I say timeless because within the realm of dependent origination, all is simultaneous. Now, I know we're getting like just super spacey right now. Trust me, I know. But we're at level eight. I don't know what you, I don't know what you want me to do. But are there any questions about the patient tolerance for the non-origination of all phenomena? I, right? It's very hard to describe, but I feel like I did my best. Right? It's about being very, very present to simultaneously originated phenomena and recognizing that seeing things as products or as relative to their past, no. It's about a present simultaneous arising of all phenomena, including you right now. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just, I, I can't believe you have any questions. <laughs> I know. I, it's so perfectly clear. Is the, is the clock, is it, uh, is that the idea? I mean, the thing that, that got me the most in that whole thing was like, this clock was, was never manufactured. And I'm just like, yes, it was. <laughs> it was a factory. But you, you know, it wasn't. I already told you, I, I'll tell you again. No, no, I'm talking about. <laughs> is, it, is it about the simultaneity of all of it? You want to see it again? The parts that go to China and then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't you, need to see that again. You don't, I know, that's what I mean. But that's the example. Okay, well, that's an example of that the clock does not, does not have a self. It doesn't have an inherent self. Nor, an, nor does it have a point of origination. A point of origination. Okay, got it. R right? Got it. So you so, can talk about the present but, configuration. Yeah, okay. So what, what I think what, what, let me, let me just reiterate then, I, because I think you said that it wasn't made anywhere. And, you know, I mean, there was a point when those pieces were in a factory somewhere and they were being made, but you're saying that that's not its origination. That's like Tanya's question where no, but the pieces though, uh, okay. and for each piece, the same truth applies. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I know I'm not <laughs> the only one who was wondering that <laughs> in my defense. <laughs> so, but is it also just kind of like, you know, the this pen isn't the same pen that was here a second ago, literally. Like, it's not the same pen that was here a second ago. Like something, you know, let's just go back to the normal talking about reality, like a molecule could have come off of this or something, right? It's just sure. not the same thing, right? So and that's and kind of the way, that's the kind of way I was looking at it. So this pen that's here right now, 
um, this pen yep. that's here right now was not the pen that was manufactured whenever it was manufactured. So is that kind of like what you're getting at? It, it is, but it, it's like, so- Like you were saying, like you're not the Michael that was like in the crib, you're the Michael now. So the Michael now, you were birthed in the last second or whatever minuscule second in that sense, but you didn't come from a womb. Is that kind of like what you're saying? Kind of, but your example of the pen, Tanya, it makes me think of Connie's question from a long time ago where I answered about language. Because when you say this pen, does that include the cap or not? What exactly is this pen? And what I mean is the language game is that the mind can create words and definite in like box things in as much as it wants. But when you say this pen, what exactly are you talking about? And yes, Tanya, exactly what you were talking about. A molecule flies off. So were, were we talking about the pen before that molecule fell off or after that molecule fell off? But I'm talking, we don't even have to get molecular. It's sort of like, is it the ink that's in that pen? But if it runs out of ink and I replace the ink, is that a new pen? What exactly is this pen? And the idea is eventually the pranya mind is like, oh my God, this is a language game. There actually isn't anything. It's just these words. <laughs> and so it's that pen that is not manufactured or created, the one that I have the name for in that way. <laughs> okay. Is everybody doing okay with, all, again, this is like a you know, birthlessness of, if, basically if you really develop the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things, you're there, you're in there. <laughs> it's like, so if this is like, oh, what is he talking? Like, don't worry, please don't worry. This is, there's really only two crazier places to go than this. And that is step nine. And I keep calling these steps. I don't mean them to be steps, but the ninth, you know, most uh, um, uh, cultivated dharma of the bodhisattva, developing pranya, the ninth is the power of wisdom. There are also these various powers that have been introduced. I mentioned this about the power of meditation, these power of patience. And there's this idea that when one really, truly, deeply cultivates this pranya, there actually becomes or there develops a bala or a power. And these powers are hard to describe, but the, you know, there's a, I'm just going to drop this on you. Why not? It's been such a crazy night. There's a beautiful line in the, if you, if anybody knows this beautiful Shurangama Sutra, there's a beautiful line in this Shurangama Sutra in which the Buddha talks about the deluded mind being turned around by objects rather than the enlightened mind that can turn objects around. It's one of my favorite lines. The deluded mind is turned around by objects and the enlightened mind turns objects around. And without getting, you know, I only have five minutes and I do want to talk about the last one. And I would also love to field any questions, but the idea of this idea of the power of pranya, the power of this understanding of dependent origination and all of these steps in between, all of this, the idea is, is that the deluded mind thinks the apple is red and that it is only red and it is red for everybody. And that idea of an objectively red apple is a delusion according to everything we're talking about. But the mind that doesn't recognize that is turned around by the red apple. 
And we, what we mean by turned around, of course, is diluted, confused. You want it, you don't want it. It's like, I hate red apples. Well, you realize the redness is in your own mind, right? No, I hate red apples, right? It's like the idea that the refusal to understand what's being spoken about, and it's like, no, it's just out there. That mind is, is subject to the world in that way because it believes that it can only be one way and that you're at the mercy of the world. The enlightened mind, and if you really were following along tonight and all about dependent origination, and in particular, in particular, you are a co-creator of everything that you're experiencing in that dependent origination way. And your conditioning and your mind is that co-conspirator, that co-creator in all of this. And so the idea is, is that if you can not be turned around by objects by thinking they're objectively true out there, but understand the role of conditioning, the role of the mind in all of this, you could turn objects around. Actually, well, at, a, at the highest level of attainment, actually being able to, to change the color of the apple in a way but not through any trick of magic, through a deep understanding of what it is that is creating this phenomenal reality to begin with. So again, none of that should be like sound surprising given everything we've just talked about. It's just sort of about the magnitude of that idea in, in that way of like, oh, wow, I'm a co-creator in all of this. And that actually means that you can co-create. You're, again, you're not subject to reality in the way that you might think in that way. And just to top this off, number 10, the, if you get all the way, the 10th foremost practice or dharma concerning pranya is the development of unhindered or unobstructed knowledge. And this is not pranya, by the way, this is jnana. So not pranyana, which is what we're talking about. Pranya is actually pranyana, pra knowledge. The jnana is just knowledge. And the highest or one of the highest states that a bodhisattva achieves is what's called the state of unobstructed knowledge. And since I, I have two minutes, which means a lifetime. So if you can understand how like, like um, right now, this is also, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift all of this from the Shirangama Sutra. If you could understand how everything that you can maybe see is because it's illuminated by, illuminated by a light source. So like everything maybe in your room right now, but if you look outside, you can't see outside because it's either not illuminated or because it's obstructed by walls. So your knowledge, your understanding and your vision right now is obstructed. You can only see that which is in your purview and you can't see what's on the other side of the walls. You can't see beyond that, right? Well, if you were to imagine a knowledge that is unobstructed. So not like your vision that is obstructed. So we're kind of talking about being able to see through solid objects, but that would be exclusively vision-based. Oh, so you mean I can hear long distances? You mean I can develop the divine ear? Yeah, but that's exclusively auditory. Oh, I can smell. Yeah, yeah, that's all the sensory organs. Unobstructed knowledge is actually, well, not that I pretend to have it or even know what it is, but my feeling about it from all the sutras I read is that it is a deep type of like, almost like, um, you know, that kind of like um, forensic type of vision where people can see you know, whatever, maybe it's like footprints in the sand. And even though there's the footprints in the sand, they can deduce 
what created the footprints in the sand. And so there's this, a vision or a knowledge that is more than what is present, but it can be deduced from what is present. Everybody with, I saw, I saw a few nods ahead, a number of nods ahead, sweet. So that type of idea of like, you know, you have to have certain eyes to be able to see footprints and see like what caused them. So it's about um, induction, deduction. It's about a lot, right? Well, imagine applying that idea with dependent origination eyes where you can actually deduce or induce or whatever all things from any one given thing due to this vastly wild interconnected nature of independent reality. That would be unobstructed knowledge where you're not relying on your eyes and your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body, or even your, your uh, you know, cranium and cr encased brain, not through those, but actually through a wisdom of understanding dependent origination. That's, that would be unobstructed knowledge. So knowledge, knowledge, unconditioned knowledge. Could I... Great way of putting it. Awesome way of putting it. All right, folks, although I had my doubts, we did it. <laughs> we made it through all 10. <laughs> Any last questions, ideas, comments, ideas, epiphanies? All right, then.